Okay, good morning. We're really excited to continue the fantastic conversation around adaptability and resilience in the workforce. My name is Ann McKenna, and I will be the moderator for this session. And I will say that the first panel did a fantastic job setting the stage for why adaptability matters and is a wonderful transition into this panel, which is a focus on, well, what is adaptability from a variety of perspectives? And so we will hear from experts in the field on adaptability from an individual perspective, from an interpersonal perspective, from a team perspective, and an organizational perspective. And so really uh, giving the uh, definition and some clarity around what that means at all of these levels. And in the spirit of adaptability, uh, this panel has decided that they each want to do something a little different uh, in terms of the way they present, including we have someone who is joining us virtually. Ernie uh, could not be here, but he is here uh, on the line, and so he will uh, present uh, in his turn uh, by phone. So the structure of this session is somewhat similar with a, a twist. So the presenters will each present 12 to 15 minutes. Then we will ask them to comment on each other's work. Uh, and then after that period, we will open it up for question and answer. And so I will now uh, hand it off. Dr. Christian Schoen is our first speaker. He is a senior scientist at the Learning Research and Development Center and a professor of psychology, learning sciences and policy, and intelligence systems at the University of Pittsburgh. Okay, thank you. So um, what I wanna help us think about uh, this morning is uh, kind of um, a conundrum uh, of, of sorts, uh, and that is, um, uh, from a individual biological perspective, uh, why is this even uh, a topic? Why aren't we all uh, adaptable? Um, and uh, so let's start off with a, a kind of a definition of uh, adaptation. As the uh, environment changes, uh, a uh, individual or whatever unit of analysis you want to have uh, behaves differently uh, in a way that improves outcomes. So it's sort of a fundamental, we don't talk about adaptability if the environment's not changing, and we don't talk about it as adaptability if you change in a way that doesn't improve outcomes. There's, there's got to be this uh, uh, improved uh, response. Uh, and uh, when we talk about biological systems, uh, all the way through the body, not just you know the trillions of connections in, in the brain, but all the way through, we're fundamentally a changeable system. Every part of us is sort of wired uh, 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 to adapt. Um, so you know, look at pretty much anyone who's been studied at any grain size, they are uh, changing over time. Uh, even when you look at uh, infants uh, learning uh, uh, to uh, crawl or climb, they pretty quickly adapt to new environments and they've got strategies to figure out, uh, oh, this environment's different, or today I'm 5% you know, heavier, so I'm gonna need to crawl up uh, these steps in a different way or I'm wearing something slightly heavier. It's just sort of built into us uh, from the beginning uh, that we uh, adapt. However, uh, the form of adaptation, uh, it, it tends to be a relatively slow adaptation. So uh, here's a, just in a, in a graph uh, where in this particular study, uh, uh, <coughs> we changed what the response, what the right response was from, in the beginning it was like 50-50, you have no, there's no better response. You go either way, uh, it's, you got 50-50 of getting it right, to then we made one particular thing right 80% of the time, and people gradually adapted up, and then we switched it out on them, so now the other response is right 80% of the time, and they gradually come down, so, um, 
Yeah, and if you plot since the beginning of, of this environment, what on average was right, just ignoring time, what on average is right, that's uh, the dotted line. People are pretty close to the global average. Uh, that is, they're not paying attention to what recently was true, they're just sort of responding overall. Uh, and this provides one of the clues uh, regarding uh, uh, differences in adaptivity. If you've been in a fixed environment for a really long time, and you're uh, uh, sort of typically responding in a slow global average kind of way, you'll be slower to respond to more recent experiences than someone who's come in relatively recent and they haven't got that really huge accumulated, this is one way that tends to work uh, kind of experience. So that's sort of um, uh, one of the insights that uh, comes into this. Uh, and just to point out, you know, we're not the only ones that adapt. Raccoons, if you've ever tried to stop a raccoon from getting into something, you know, it might work for one day, maybe for two days, and then they figured out how to get into your thing. Uh, and you can go to creatures with way smaller brains, and they actually adapt uh, in, uh, uh, to all kinds of uh, uh, changing uh, stimuli. So it's just from a biological perspective, there's adaptation. Um, but curiously, though, uh, uh, some of people adapt more than others. Um, so if you uh, plot uh, on the, uh, how much a person has adapted to a change in the environment and how many people are at sort of a low level, medium level, high level, you get your typical normal distributions and you got some people adapting way more than others and some people adapting way less uh, than others. Uh, and this uh, matters especially in dynamic tasks. So the more the, the, the kind of task environment that they're in where there's constantly change uh, that's going on, people who are more adaptive tend to do much better overall in the task. And that's even if you control all your, your other typical individual differences in cognitive abilities. Uh, this uh, degree to which you tend to adapt quickly uh, uh, drives performance overall to a pretty high uh, extent. Okay, so this is just to say there is this cognitive layer uh, to adaptability um, uh, that's something that we want to think about in addition to the organizational layers and the interpersonal, there is this uh, foundation. Uh, <clears throat> Interestingly, one of the, the big things that's driving why some people are adapting more to a particular change than others has to do with the uh, awareness of the changes in the environment. So some people, uh, it, this is kind of a fascinating thing, even though you're completely unaware that anything is different, people gradually change. You know, you, sort of, you can ask them all sorts of different ways, and a bunch of people will just have no idea that things are different, even pretty drastic changes, and yet their body does things differently over time. That's sort of the foundational biological nature of continuous learning. Your brain is constantly retraining itself, uh, and there will be uh, change. Yet those who are aware, oh, wait, something's different, they shift way more quickly. Uh, so this extra conscious layer that we have that, uh, well, probably the raccoons have, but the, definitely the pigeons don't have, allows us to change more quickly than other uh, creatures, but only if we're aware of it. We're looking out for change. We're seeing something different. Okay, so I wanted to add that. Uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, and then the, the next piece I want to address has to do uh, with uh, sort of uh, damaged capacities. Um, so we know that the frontal lobes, the sort of frontal area uh, of the brain, uh, is a really important part of this fast adaptation. Uh, so like all of the brain is, is constantly tuning itself, but this idea that now something's different than what was going on before, that's when the frontal lobes come online and we force ourselves to do something different than what we've, you know, our muscle memory is telling us. Uh, to do, uh, and there are some nice uh, diagnostic batteries that they use 
uh, with patients, uh, where you're getting someone to do some simple match, follow the pattern, follow the pattern, and then they switch the pattern after you get 10 right in a row, and then you gotta switch to that, and then once you get 10 new right in a row, they switch it again on you. Um, and people who have frontal lobe damage, they're really horrible at this. They can s tell, oh, something is different, uh, but they can't change their behavior. So they've got this weird subjective like, okay, and this is gonna be wrong, and this is gonna be wrong. <laughs> uh, in some ways, this is uh, connected to those who know that they've got an inappropriate behavior and they can't stop themselves from doing it. You know, there are people who don't have frontal lobe damage who also do that, but <laughs> <laughs> of the people with frontal lobe damage, at least they've got a biological excuse. <laughs> Uh, for their inappropriate uh, uh, behaviors. Uh, so this is a small part uh, to be added to the aging story. The frontal lobes are the last to develop among the lobes. So in, into adolescence, there's still a lot of change going on there. And they're the first to go uh, with uh, aging. Um, but it's not an inevitable change. Uh, we've been learning a lot about environmental factors that influence this, uh, and, uh, including exercise. Just getting off of your can and moving around on a regular basis, uh, we now know uh, is, a, is a strong protective factor against decline of the frontal lobes. So little interventions where people do uh, you know, kind of walk around the mall, not like run around and, you know, risk heart attack, but just getting around and walking around, uh, you can find significant uh, protection against loss of white matter and gray matter, uh, including uh, in the frontal lobes. So, <clears throat> yes, there is this decline uh, in the, the, can start as early as the 50s, but can be put off way into the 80s through uh, some protective factors, and it is related to adaptability. Okay, and now uh, the last piece I wanna lean into uh, some of the other uh, topics. Uh, motivation in the individual uh, matters a lot. There's a number of factors that enter into this. One of them that I uh, especially like is this promotion focus. So you can, as you're trying to do well, you can have a prevention focus, which is, uh, I just want us, I want us not go down. I want to prevent decline. Uh, it's sort of a, uh, you might think of it as a position of fear, uh, or maybe even a pr position of arrogance. You know, we are awesome, and my goal is just to not go down. Uh, versus promotion, my goal is to do even better than we're doing now uh, in whatever level we're at. Um, so it turns out those who have a promotion focus, they're trying to get better as opposed to preventing decline, are much more open to uh, newcomer innovation. So if somebody comes in with a new idea, it's those who are trying to improve that are gonna be receptive to that. And especially if they think they can do better. And this is sort of another piece uh, that I want to uh, add into this uh, conversation that we had. Uh, humility is important uh, in this, but there's the other end of that. When people think essentially their odds of success are really low, uh, sort of extreme humility, you might uh, say, that itself can be uh, problematic. Um, uh, and then... Um, uh, various uh, individual perspectives on their adaptability in their career uh, has also been linked to this uh, promotion focus. So those uh, who are really constantly looking for ways to improve are the ones that will be more likely to be, uh, think that they have control over change, are curious over change, are confident uh, uh, in their changes. Um, and I think I want to leave it at that. Okay. Thank you.
Thank you. Our next speaker is going to join us on the phone. I'd like to introduce Dr. Ernest Wilson. He is the founding director of the Center for Third Space Thinking, which is devoted to research, teaching, and executive education on soft skills in the digital age. Welcome, Ernie. It's, it's good to be here. <laughs> Vir virtually. I, ju I just want to uh, suggest that this demonstrates uh, our adaptability um, to be able to uh, use this form of communication um, and to adapt to new circumstances. Um, I want to be able to build on what uh, Professor Christian Schoon said, which I thought was very interesting and fits directly uh, into my own brief presentation, which as you can see on the slides is entitled Definition and Context. Um, and what I want to do is really uh, go internally into what we mean by adaptability and contrast it with some other terms that uh, appear in the literature on a pretty regular basis. Um, and when I've done that, um, I then want to place the idea of adaptability in a broader context of interpersonal and interactive skills. Um, in some ways, a liaison between my presentation uh, and Christian's presentation is uh, he has pointed out awareness of change and motivation. So one of the interesting questions is, how do people become aware that they need to adapt or that there are opportunities to adapt? Or how do they become aware that there are few opportunities to adapt? Um, and then finally, I'm just going to uh, close by saying a few things about uh, uh, the trajectory of learning and adaptability in an interpersonal uh, context. Um, so I would start with uh, simply by suggesting, um, if we can go to the slide, mm -hmm. adaptability is fundamental. Um, that is a uh, critical element. I think you've already discussed that this morning. Um, but volatility, uncertainty, and complexity and ambiguity uh, are leading um, the drive for greater attention to adapt adaptability. Um, but I want to also suggest that in a lot of the literature, there are certain uh, themes, if you will, that um, I think we should pay attention to in our research and certainly in practice. Um, number one, and this is on the slide, critical elements, is that um, a lot of the literature, especially on flexibility uh, as a term, uh, resilience, tends to focus on uh, the appropriate responses to negative um, developments in the environment rather than positive opportunities. And I think that's something we may want to attend, pay attention to. Um, the idea of anticipating changes and not just reacting to them is a second issue that I think was worth speaking about, again, especially based on the previous presentation. Um, thirdly, the extent to which uh, adaptation is driven by an individual's desire and intention uh, to improve their performance rather than the boss walking down the hall and said, here are the four things you must do to adapt or you're fired. So where does the initiative come from? Um, are those changes going to be ones that have modest change or are they, uh, will they require significant alterations of behavior? Uh, and there are other issues like that that I think we can pay attention to, but I just want to underscore uh, those, those kinds of differences. Uh, the following chart that says differentiating adaptability is just a notional idea of, um, of a range of uh, ways to think about adaptability. Uh, adaptability I see as a more long-term um, change that does require investment, human capital investment, over the short and medium term. My interest in this topic has uh, come from a five-year research project that we have done looking at, at, at USA, we've done at USC Annenberg School, um, on the topic of soft skills. What do we mean by soft skills? How do we measure them? 
And the main point for today that I want to make is that looking at adaptability as one element is an important thing to do and drilling down and defining it. But ultimately, the success of adaptability will be deeply informed by one's ability to have and demonstrate a series of other attributes, four other attributes, cultural competency, intellectual curiosity, empathy and 360 degree thinking, and those are available uh, on slide six. Uh, you should see uh, five circles um, surrounding a center circle that is called third space, and we call it third space because with all due respect, it's not the, uh, the space of engineering or of MBA thinking, it's a different way of thinking about the world. And so what I will very, very briefly do is suggest that um, each of those four attributes can be evaluated in terms of the ways in which they affect adaptability. And these are not aspects of adaptability necessarily, but they are attributes, competencies, if you will, which can be leveraged to enhance adaptability. And over the past two years, we have been teaching those five attributes to executives, to uh, graduate students, uh, to undergraduates and others. And uh, we have found some success in being able to teach those four attributes. So very quickly, uh, if we look at the first, if we look at cultural competence, this is simply an example. Um, intersections with adaptability uh, by that, I mean that substantial and sustainable adaptability, and I underscore sustainable adaptability, is probably not going to work very well if the person making, attempting to make those changes is ignorant of the culture into which that person is trying to adapt. That could be a different organization. It could be a different country. Uh, it could be, as likely, a different unit within the same company or institution. Uh, so cultural competence and adaptability can be seen as mutually reinforcing. Um, empathy, there's been a great deal of talk uh, lately about the idea of empathy. Um, and if we think about that in terms of adaptability, we can say that while it's important to learn the formal written rules of an organization or a culture uh, or a company that the superior employee, the one that we want to keep to promote, is eager to see the world not only from her or his perspective, but from the perspective of colleagues in the organization and customers. Uh, we see the consequences in Silicon Valley over the past couple of weeks and months of the lack of empathy. Uh, and adaptability. Um, and so that is certainly, I think, a topic worth paying attention to. Uh, just two other uh, quick interventions on, on this area uh, is intellectual curiosity. Um, that can probably be nurtured. Uh, it probably can't be taught from scratch. It's very difficult. But I think everyone can improve intellectual curiosity. That can be developed. But it's probably the case that the successful adapter will be more curious about pretty much every aspect of her own job, as well as positions that are adjacent to hers, up and down the value chain, and with coworkers. Uh, so intellectual curiosity, uh, I believe, is essential for adaptability. Um, and the interesting question, in some ways, this parallels the awareness of change uh, and the motivational element. Uh, that well, we just heard described at the individual level. And then finally, uh, and the most difficult to, exp uh, to describe, but is very important, is what I call 360 degree thinking, which is the ability to see the big picture, to connect the dots, um, to think holistically. And that clearly um, intersects with adaptability uh, because every position, um, of course, is part of a larger whole in an organization, or for that matter, in a society. 
and the successful adapter will be able to see his or her relationships with others in groups, institutions, in formal settings or informal settings. And they will also be able to recognize that, um, at least convince themselves, that there are changes taking place. This intersects with, uh, with Dr. Shun's presentation, uh, the awareness of the changes. Uh, it sounds like the hypothesis is the more aware one is of changes in the world, uh, other things being the same, the more likely is one to want to adapt. Um, let me conclude then by saying that these issues of, of uh, interpersonal uh, relationships, et cetera, will change through time, uh, not only biologically, but also organizationally. And so the uh, illustration uh, that uh, number 12, adaptability and career trajectory, simply is uh, uh, offered to you to suggest that at the early stages of a career, at the middle stages of a career, and toward uh, the end uh, of a career, the demands and expectations of the organization will change over time. So at the front end of a career, um, when we place our students, our graduates, in various organizations, uh, our research suggests that the expectation from the employer is that that person will be adaptable because they're adapting to a new uh, organization where they're working. They'll be intellectually curious, but they're not expected uh, to have a lot of 360 degree perspective. However, again, our interviews show is that the more one uh, goes up a hierarchy or spends time in a position, the greater is the expectation that that person will bring that special soft skill, which is the ability to see the whole picture, to think 360 degrees, uh, et cetera. Uh, so I'll conclude simply by saying that uh, this kind of work reflects uh, earlier work of the National Academy uh, on the engineer of 2020 um, and a number of other studies that have been done by the National Research Council and others uh, to suggest that adaptability and especially its integration with soft skills are extraordinarily important. And the interesting research question is how do we integrate uh, the development of these soft skills over a career, uh, not just for executives, but for all uh, people who are working, all employees at all levels, and then how do we integrate those soft skills with the hard skills that have traditionally uh, been the domain of, uh, of engineering professionals. So let me stop there and look forward to our conversation. Thank you, Ernie. So next up is Steve Kozlowski. He is a professor of organizational psychology at Michigan State University, and he will talk about adaptability from a team perspective. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I thought I'd start with a little background. I'm an organizational psychologist. Uh, I've been studying individual and team adaptability for a couple of decades. Uh, right now, most of the research is focused on team adaptability, and we do it in three different domains. So one area is to what I call translational science. So it's applying what we already know to areas that can benefit. So this is uh, medical trauma teams where we train team leaders or team members to be uh, focused on team processes and adaptation. Uh, we're doing some work to help design principles for simulation design. Uh, second area is working with NASA. NASA is going to send astronauts to Mars. Uh, it may be a decade and a half to two decades. That'll be basically three, 33 months. You and five friends in a really tiny space with no privacy, very little communication back home, and you're going to have to you know, be able to manage those interpersonal relationships for that long period of time. We don't actually know much about that scientifically, and so we study teams uh, in the Antarctic and in some dedicated mission simulations for upwards of 12 months. Um, and then an uh, area I, f I find really fascinating is, you know, Organizational science slices the system into levels. So this, this session is like the individuals, teams, the organization. Unfortunately, systems actually work in highly interconnected ways, not in these discrete 
levels. And so one of the challenges is how do you look across the levels, oh, and over time as well. Uh, it's really hard to do with real people and real organizations. Uh, and so we're working with uh, computation modeling and simulation so that we can do some explorations uh, and hopefully be able to do some prescription about how do, you, how do you build systems so that they are robust to certain kinds of changes and that they can then adapt. So what structures, what leadership forms, how do you compose teams, et cetera. Uh, with that in mind, I wanted to start with just a little bit of systems thinking, right? So there are two primary forces that drive behavior in organizations at all levels. One is top-down effects. Organizations are nested in environments. That influences organization strategies and structures, which influences the team, which influences the person. And yesterday, the keynote, Franz talked about disruptive innovations, like the invention of the iPhone. Well, the effect of that was to disrupt the environment. Terraberry talked about this in 1968, that, that adaptation was emerging from the field in unpredictable ways. That's what that was. And if you were Nokia or if you were a BlackBerry, it was a really bad day. Uh, and those companies never really recovered, right? It's hard to, to recover from those abruptive, disruptive kinds of changes. The other major force is bottom up. So that team processes, we talk about this as emergent, but you can think of this going beyond just teams. And by emergence, we mean how it is that individuals interact and intersect with those characteristics that make them special, right? Their, their cognitive ability, their personality characteristics, and those things take on collective properties under particular circumstances. And so we're really interested in this because those phenomena that emerge collectively are malleable during the process by which they are being formed and emerge. So if you understand something about the mechanisms underlying it, you can shape it, you can influence it. So I just want to illustrate this a bit. Uh, we're looking here at, where's the uh, laser? Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie. Oh, yeah, yeah, all right, so you just have to translate. Alpha, Bravo, and Charlie are three individuals, and they're in a space, and what we're interested in is that they are going to form some collective phenomena, so it's multi-level, goes from individuals to team, it emerges over time. It does so in a particular context that, that's exerting these top-down effects. And the key feature, if we want to influence it, is understanding the process mechanisms that drive those interactions. So this is obviously just notional. They're interacting, and they're interacting in ways that shape a collective construct or concept that emerges. So I know Linda's going to be talking about different kinds of collective cognition. Some of those forms of collective cognition are things that are convergent. Everybody comes to view the world in the same way. We have shared mental models. That helps us coordinate. Sometimes it's distributed. It's more like a network. So we have different forms of expertise. Different experts have that knowledge. We have to be able to access it. It's a pattern. It's a configuration. They're really different. So if you want to shape those, you want to come in during the process. Once it emerges, it has persistence. So it will tend to influence subsequent interactions. And so if you want to change it after it's taken hold, it's a lot harder than if you do it when it's forming up. So what is adaptability? It's the proverbial elephant and blind men. We, we, it means many different things. It's a big bucket for really talking about how do people or other entities respond to change. You've heard lots of different terms. We've applied it to different levels of the system. It doesn't mean exactly the same thing at every level. And in terms of defining it different ways, you have to think about the underlying change. So change can be viewed as incremental. So this is where continuous improvement, we're getting better and better, but it's forecastable. We can see the future. It's a little bit about ahead, but we can track it. And it can be metamorphic. So you're going along, and all of a sudden, things change. The iPhone has been invented. Our business model has been disrupted. All of the relationships we had with our stakeholders, gone. Right? These are really different forms of change. And a lot of the research has tended to focus on the disruptive change because that's a lot harder to figure out. So this one's a little herky-jerky, but basically it's talking about performance capabilities that people and team members possess and how those performance capabilities have to be flexibly redeployed if the role requirements change, if what you need to do to perform your job is now different. Or here, a simpler one where cognitive, affective, motivational, and behavioral modifications are made in response to some kind of change in the environment or the task. Altering behavior to meet the demands of the environment event or a new situation. Uh, this one tries to throw everything in there, 10 years of research, but an emergent phenomena that compiles over time from the unfolding of a recursive cycle whereby one or more team members use their resources to functionally change current cognitive or behavioral goal-directed action or structures to meet expected or unexpected demands. Whew. All right, that's a theory paper. 
So my colleagues and I did a look at the research literature focused on individuals and teams uh, roughly three years ago. So the concept here is just performance adaptation. We're kind of narrow. It's not every kind. It's about adapting your performance. And this is us, not us imposing a taxonomy, but looking at what's in the literature bottom up and say, well, what are people investigating? So there are really two big branches to this research. One is what we label domain general. Okay, so this is about thinking about broadly what are some desirable characteristics performance-wise that we might want to try to measure. So that's this idea of a performance construct, and I know somebody will be talking here later, but this is work by Palakos and colleagues, and they have eight dimensions that they develop, things like uh, dealing with emergencies, handling stress, uh, managing uncertainty, learning, uh, being culturally adaptive, uh, um, interpersonally adaptive, physically adaptive, et cetera. Uh, and then you would look for corresponding, well, what kind of characteristics, general cognitive ability, personality characteristics, are broadly predictive of, of those kinds of capabilities. These would be things that other people, supervisors, would have to rate and measure, which, by the way, they're not always that good at uh, being able to draw those, uh, those kind of ratings. Uh, the other is domain-specific, and domain-specific says it's much more contextualized, Right, so we're talking about particular kinds of expertise in a particular context. If I'm talking about teams, it's about the people I have to interact with. I, you, this isn't plug and play. I've got to learn how to be flexible with those people. Um, and so the way that's tended to be examined is people are in some kind of a situation and then it changes abruptly and we're looking to see how quickly they recover. So some kind of manipulations or interventions and individual differences get measured and then how well do they recover? Uh, or more process oriented where Stuff's happening, you're doing your job, and all of a sudden it's not working so well, and you've got to detect that there's a change, you've got to diagnose what might be responsible, and now you've got to invent or experiment with potential solutions. So a little bit more um, process-oriented, hard to study even in a laboratory. I would say also that um, domain general is more selection-oriented. You know, if you're thinking about human capital, this is what you pay for when you hire people. So I want to pay more for people who are more cognitively able, have higher education, et cetera, um, whereas domain specifics is about training and development. Now that I have these skill sets, how do I develop them? Uh, yeah, and I would just say uh, the domain journals, more distal kinds of predictors, uh, and uh, domain specific, more proximal. So if you know exactly what kind of adaptability you're talking about, then it's about the proximal. If you're not sure so much, then you're more on the domain general side. I would just like to go back to this notion that adaptation is emergent. This is really a training and development kind of perspective so that when you put people in teams, they start off, they're trying to figure out why are we here, what are we doing, what are our goals, how do we operate, how open is the system, is it rigid or can I be uh, open about my thoughts? And then you're really fo self-focused. I have to be able to demonstrate my own proficiency and capability. As people get comfortable with that, you can push them through more to working out dyadic relationships. How do I exchange with other people that I have to coordinate with? And the idea is that as a team matures in its capabilities, it now has the latitude to do some exploration. Okay, so a big deal here is about building a repertoire of possible responses. This was a theme last night. You know, you can't predict the future, so let's imagine what the future might be. Uh, this must be on timings because I didn't do that. Um, and so being able to, let's remove that person from our team and get the job done. Let's have that piece of equipment come down. Let's imagine that the environment changed in a particular way. What would we do? That gives you an opportunity to think about the future. Uh, you think about uh, Captain Sullenberger on the uh, U.S. air flight. You have, you've been in a simulator, you've practiced em engine flameouts, but you couldn't predict that birds would hit you, take out both engines, right when you're still in a power climb. And now you have a matter of seconds to figure out what the heck are we going to do about that. That's depth of expertise, that's a repertoire of skill sets, okay? So it's not just a broadband skill, this is very specific. Uh, and the idea is that you can harness this to what we would call a regulatory process. Uh, first I wanna point out, there's this idea of task complexity. Tasks can vary in how much load they put on individuals or teams. So when it's at low load, you can do things like have a strategy, set some goals. These would be to push people through a developmental process. You can monitor them uh, around skill sets that you want to develop when they're engaged in the task. You can think about ways that you need to intervene to assist them. 
Uh, and then when it's over, you could help lead a team or individuals through some kind of reflection process. So this was designed to talk about what leaders could do to push people through that kind of develop developmental process. But you could do this with training, simulation, or lots of ways that this could be done. And the, th the notion is that over time, you develop that team to where it's capable of managing itself. Again, timings are running this, not me. Um, so you can think about this regulatory process when you're in a team, you have your own goals to pursue, and you have to switch to also pursue team goals. So you have this kind of dual process mechanism. And if you play that o over time, what you find is that you get a parallel regulatory process at the team level. So in effect, by understanding how individuals are regulating around working for myself, working for the team, coordinating with others, we have a means by which we can influence the team level phenomena as well, right? So this is good for intervention design. Uh, this just kind of sums it up. I mean, here's the change in the environment. You're going to have decrements in performance, and some of these teams are going to not drop as much as others, and they're going to recover more quickly based on their characteristics and whatever interventions might be running behind them. So tying it back to where I started to some extent uh, in that review, one of, the, one of the end points of that review is to say, you know, adaptability has been defined in such a broadband way. Some studies don't even say what they mean by adaptation. We changed stuff. Well, what stuff? Changed it how? And so from a research perspective, this was just intended to say, you got to be a lot more specific so we can accumulate, engage our knowledge. But the idea here is that there are different kinds of complexity that can change. Component means task became more difficult. I've got more stuff to do in the same period of time. Coordinative means the cue and response relationships have shifted. Before when I saw this, I was supposed to do that. Now I have to do something different. And dynamic means they're both changing. And these changes have different implications. So component, working harder, is motivational. Right? So if an individual's task got more difficult, I've got to maintain my motivation. If it became coordinative, where the relationships have changed, it's cognitive. I've got to learn new stuff. And if it's dynamic, well, I've got to be doing both of those. And if it's, you know, if it's something at the team level, well, now you have both levels being implicated. So the last one I'll leave goes back to the computational modeling notion. And what my colleagues and I are trying to do is build a tool so that we can actually look at different configurations of team characteristics, different leadership structures, different way of linking teams together, and explore what kinds of structures are more robust and resilient, and those that help promote adaptation, and use that potentially to provide some prescription uh, to our sponsors and to others. So the takeaway points I would say is that these capabilities, at least within the individual and team level, they're emergent and they can be shaped. They can be nurtured. It's about the climate and the leadership and the systems that you create to do that. But you have to have some notion of the underlying mechanisms and the nature of adaptation that you're trying to inculcate in your people. Uh, and that means that those need to be clearly specified. What are we trying to target here? Because then we have knowledge that can help drive interventions. That's it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. And our next speaker is Linda Ar Argodi. She is the David M. and Barbara A. Kerr Professor of Organizational Behavior and Theory in the Tepper School of Business at Carnegie Mellon University, where she directs the Center for Organizational Learning, Innovation, and Knowledge. Thank you, Ian. <laughs> Well, it's wonderful to be here, a very uh, stimulating discussion today and last night. Uh, something Franz mentioned last night was the idea that uh, just as individuals learn, we can also think of organizations learning. Uh, and that's what I'm going to talk about in, in my time, organizational learning and adaptability. So let me, ah, there, it's going to build for you. Uh, let me start with the learning curve. So these data come from an advanced jet. There's about eight years of data. Uh, on the horizontal axis, cumulative number of aircraft produced is plotted. This is the measure of experience. On the vertical axis, the total labor hours per aircraft. Now this was a kind of pattern, and we, we weren't the first to discover this pattern, but this had been discovered many years ago uh, at the individual level. Uh, as individuals gained an experience in a task, their performance tended to improve, but at a decreasing rate. Uh, Chris has done a lot of great work at the individual level about learning. Uh, more recently, people have also discovered that this occurs at the organizational level. 
if you look at how various indicators of performance change uh, as a function of experience, they tend to uh, improve but at a decreasing rate. So our own work, we've looked at reductions in unit cost, improvements in quality, improvements in service timeliness. Other researchers have found other outcomes that show this kind of learning curve pattern. Uh, while the early work on learning curves was in manufacturing, and I'll uh, share with you some examples from aircraft uh, and truck production, uh, more recently there's been a lot of excitement about looking at learning curves in service settings, financial service settings, consulting firms, hospitals. So while this pattern has been discovered in a lot of contexts, what I think is very particularly interesting about it for our purpose today uh, that there is considerable variation in the rate at which organizations learn. Some show, some show dramatic improvement, others show little or no learning. Uh, this slide is going to illustrate that variation. Uh, these data come from three truck plants. Again, we have the number of trucks, cumulative number of trucks, the measure of experience plotted on the horizontal axes, labor hours per truck plotted on the vertical. Uh, they're all part of the same organization, so they're embedded in the same organization, the same structure, different plants, and they're doing the same product. While they all show the characteristic decrease at a decreasing rate as experience is gained, they also differ significantly in the rate at which they learn. The uh, one with the highest labor cost was under enormous pressure. Why can't you get your, your cost down to your sister plants? So even in this environment where many of the factors that we might think would cause differences in learning rates, well, the product's different or the structure's different, those things are constant here, but we still see differences in uh, learning rates. And that's what we're trying to understand. And in our time today, I'd like to talk about four factors that have received considerable attention uh, as explanations for these learning rates. Uh, the first is training. Uh, the second is developing a transactive memory or knowledge of who knows what. Uh, the third is using technology effectively. Uh, and the fourth is transferring knowledge. And Franz gave us a great example of the latter phenomena last night when he talked about how Great Ormond Hospital uh, in Britain uh, was aware that they were having problems on the patient handoff as they moved from surgical to uh, ICU or step-down units. So they looked to Ferrari Racing to uh, adopt processes in their system and found that that improved their performance. Um, we'll talk about some evidence of transfer at different levels. So two aspects of training uh, that I think are particularly relevant for organizational learning that I wanted to focus on. One is this idea of training members of a team together that that allows them to develop a transactive memory. So transactive memory is knowledge of who knows what. Uh, the term was first developed by a psychologist, Daniel Wegner, to describe the sort of specialization that happens among couples, people in uh, married couples, people in close relationships, where one person might remember the birthdays for both sides of the family. Um, someone else might remember how to get all sorts of things fixed. So you get this sort of cognitive specialization which makes it easier to coordinate because you know who's going to do the task, um, saves time. Uh, also, the task is usually done more effectively. I see some people nodding here in the, the room um, because the person with the best skills are doing it. Uh, so this kind of transactive memory system has been found to perf prove performance. Um, a colleague of mine, Dick Moreland, at the University of Pittsburgh, and our student, Diane Liang, did an initial study where we took the concept from the interpersonal level and applied it to the team level. Uh, other people have replicated in a variety of contexts. Uh, consulting teams, a recent study just came out of, of top management teams. The teams with better transactive memory systems, better developed memory systems, perform better than those lacking the memory systems. Another aspect of training that I think is especially important when we're talking about organizational learning is providing opportunities for observation, which enables the acquisition of 
tacit or hard to articulate knowledge. Uh, Chris alluded to that in his presentation where he talked about uh, some people get better without knowing why they're better. Well, to the extent that that's happening, their, their performance is improving, but they have trouble articulating why. Uh, having someone observe them, work closely by them, be able to ask, well, why did you do that? To understand their knowledge is a, a better way to transfer it than trying to rely on our usual um, explicit ways of documents or uh, explicit ways of communication. Uh, not only training uh, helps build a transactive memory, and that's training group members together does, but just the kind of natural experience that occurs in some settings uh, also leads to better transactive memories and improves performance. So we've done a study in surgical teams. I'll um, share with you the results of a colleague of mine uh, recently completed a study in software design teams and found that was uh, Sandra, uh, Sandra Slaughter, uh, Wei Feng Bo, and uh, they found the same in, in software design teams. So here's an example of some data from a study we did of, sorry, uh, hip and knee replacement surgeries. Uh, again, the cumulative number of procedures, how much experience is on the horizontal axes. Here we're looking at hours per procedure on the vertical, and you can see with organizational experience alone, they, they do get better, they develop more routines, they fine tune the technology. But if you let the team members stay together, there's another level of improvement of uh, the experience over and above just how many the hospital has done. So keeping team members together is valuable from the point of view of um, developing the sort of distributed cognition that Steve talked about in his uh, presentation, the knowledge of who knows what, the how to coordinate, being able to anticipate how to uh, act in response to the members of your team. So some of the benefits of transactive memory systems are it enables matching the most qualified individuals to the task that they're best suited for. Uh, it promotes problem solving and coordination of expertise so you know who to consult if something uh, unexpected comes up. So I know to go to Greg if I want uh, economics, or I go, where's Greg? Greg was here earlier. Um, I go to, uh, Chris is an expert on analogical reasoning in addition to the work he talked about here. So I've consulted him ab about that, or, or Steve knows about teams in uh, very extreme circumstances. So once you've got that knowledge, that saves you enormous time, because we don't have to go through everybody. We know exactly who to target, or Teresa for materials and chemical expertise and leadership expertise. So you, you know who to go to. So that saves time and improves performance. And there's uh, a study that shows that these sorts of memory systems are especially valuable in dynamic environments. Um, the intuition there is if your environment's routine, you're less likely to have something new that comes up, less likely to need to rely on someone else. It's when the environment's dynamic, when it's changing, that you're more likely to need to consult someone and rely on them from their, for their advice. Uh, using technology effectively, uh, we've looked at that in a couple of different contexts. One is a financial service firm. We recently uh, completed a study of an IT consulting firm that was using uh, Web 2.0 technology question and answer forums to uh, facilitate knowledge transfer. And the graph from the financial service firm is prettier, so that's the one I'm going to show you. Um, but we've got, uh, I should mention, this is uh, a financial service firm with six geographically distributed locations. You can see before the technology was introduced, they're moving down the learning curve. Uh, after the technology's introduced, they learn at a faster rate. And what the technology enabled them to do was to develop exception, to take exceptions and then develop processes to how to handle them that were then uh, distributed throughout all six sites. So instead of teaching, uh, treating an exception as something totally novel, they realized that some things that were treated as exceptions actually occurred with some regularity. So for those things, they would develop processes for, embed in the technology, uh, and then that was distributed to the other sites. 
Uh, and then lastly, I want to talk about knowledge transfer, the process through which one unit of a firm is affected by experience acquired from another. Uh, it's a mechanism for improving firm performance. Uh, one example we saw at one of the plants we studied was the uh, roboticized uh, paint system, which was uh, giving them some difficulty. They were able to fine tune it at one site uh, and then transferred that to other sites. So that was an example of knowledge that did transfer across the sites. So we've looked at transfer with uh, different levels, uh, across shifts in a manufacturing plant, across products in a manufacturing facility, uh, across geographically distributed establishments of a financial services firm. Uh, we've even looked at it across units of pizza franchises. Uh, and what attracted us to that setting was you have lots of units, so you can get a, a big N to um, look at transfer. Uh, and I'll show you the example of knowledge transferring from the first to the second shift. Uh, the second shift benefited from knowledge acquired on the first and started at a much higher level of productivity than the first shift. So here's the picture of that. You can see the first shift had been moving down the learning curve. It had operated, the plan had operated about uh, 20 months with one shift. It then added a second shift. The second shift benefited from all the knowledge that had been embedded in the technology. So the improvements in the paint shop were already embedded and had been made. They had been learned about in the first shift, embedded in the technology. Uh, the organization, I think, also did a terrific job of training the new members. The people on the second shift were predominantly new employees. Uh, there were some uh, courses to train them, but then they had a two-week period where the newcomers worked side by side the existing members uh, and were gradually weaned so they worked independently. So that enabled them to really, uh, I think it comes back to the comment that came up last night, the importance of doing, that you learn by doing, uh, you acquire the tacit knowledge, you see how things fit together, um, which was a very effective way of transferring. So I see my time is up, so I will stop there. Thank you. Thank you, Linda. So I'd like to start with the elephant in the room, uh, adaptability, from Steve's uh, presentation, in that he raises an interesting point that adaptability is often used in multiple ways to mean multiple things to very different people, and I think their studies illustrate that it is, in fact, a systems-level kind of uh, concept, in that if we really are thinking about adaptability following on from our earlier presentations and what that means to the future workforce and educating our current students to be more adaptable. I would like to ask each of the panelists from that systems perspective and really taking what we know about adaptability from your studies, can you help us think about what we might be able to do, we're all passionate here, we all want to make these changes, but what are some limitations that you have found in your studies? Uh, what should we be aware of as we start to embark on, on this new endeavor? And so I'll start with Chris if you have any comments. So uh, there's this um, really fascinating uh, trade-off <coughs> in this uh, short-term versus long-term uh, kind of gains. You can think about it as a uh, uh, exploitation versus exploration kind of trade-off. Am I going to do right now, which is that which I've learned has been pretty good as a way of doing things, and then I'm more likely to do well today? Or am I going to spend some time exploring some other ways of doing things that might work out less well today, but down the road? Uh, will lead uh, to, to good things. Uh, and it, it relates to this r really interesting observation that in, in some kinds of task environments, uh, pigeons and crocodiles are actually smarter than people, uh, and that's in a totally unchanging environment. The pigeon and the crocodile, they'll quickly sort of maximize. They'll just be an exploiter. Like, this is where the food was, and I'm only going to do this, and I'm not going to go anywhere else. Whereas people are like, 
well, it's been working for like a thousand trials, but I'm gonna try over there just one more time. And in a fixed environment, it's sort of crazy talk, but in a changing environment, you know, now there could be something better uh, over there. Uh, and uh, creating training environments that encourage <laughs> some level of exploration uh, that allows you to keep something else developing. So you're developing this expertise, which you will need, you know, in order to compete today, but you need to have the time to explore some other things along the way. And, and Ernie, I, I, I think you're still out there on the line. Uh, any, any I, I have indeed. <laughs> okay. um, so a, any comments on what you've heard in, in terms of pulling together some ideas uh, across these presentations? Yeah, I, I have sort of two things that come to mind. One at the sort of uh, very macro level of how do we convince people who are working, how do we convince uh, workers or students that it's a really big deal and we're in a situation that really demands uh, adaptation. Um, you know, this, the world is volatile, um, it's uncertain, it's ambiguous, and that really, really requires everyone to, uh, to understand that, get on board and do something about it. So I have found in some of the leadership training and executive development that we have been doing with companies like IBM and Google and Arrow Electronics and Chinese government is that when we try to go, this is more sort of the executive level or manage, upper management, when we try to go directly into, uh, let's say, tactics for improving performance using soft skills, that that doesn't work as well if we start with what our clients and, and colleagues would call, oh, that stuff is too academic, which is beginning with the structural shifts, the movement from industrialization to a digital economy, that a little bit of that goes a long way uh, because we have to convince uh, the people that we're interacting with that this is a really big deal and will affect not only the company's performance but their individual performance. And I think that's not easy to do, finding the balance between a big macro historical introduction of five minutes to show that we are all in the same boat together. So that's the motivational component that is difficult. The other one that is at the opposite end and was a big surprise to me, um, as a professor who likes to lecture and talk about the big scale stuff, we found that in providing this kind of soft skill training of adaptability and the other competencies, that exercises embedded in training and leadership development programs were as highly um, uh, appreciated as the brilliant lectures that I thought I should be giving for 90% of the time. Um, it turns out that some of these fairly straightforward, simple, hands-on teamwork activities, uh, there are things like the marshmallow challenge that some of you may have heard of. Um, and there are other sort of hands-on, almost gamification uh, ways of, of conveying this seem to have a very positive impact. So I think both the macro level to explain the urgency and universality of the uh, changes, as well as very well thought out group activities, uh, combining that I have found to be very really helpful. Thank you, and you raise a good point of thinking at it very high level, the macro level, but at the end of the day, uh, something needs to happen uh, for a particular activity with particular individuals, and so moving in between those, those two stages. And Steve, any comments? Yeah, yeah I'd uh, comment a little bit or amplify what Christian was talking about. Um, you know, in the, in the research that we've done, there are different manipulations as well as individual difference characteristics that we examine to see what helps people adapt when something unexpected happens. Um, 
And the educational psychologists talk about this as creating desirable difficulties for the learner. If you think about a lot of education, it's proceduralized. We, we kind of show you all the rules, and you're supposed to learn it rote. Whereas uh, a lot of the techniques are really based on giving people some goals about here's what you need to learn, here's the tools available, uh, here's some instruction, you're going to get to practice, you'll get some feedback that's pretty diagnostic. Uh, and what you find is if you contrast that kind of training with people who are given the proceduralized rules uh, during training, the folks with the rules do way better. It looks like they're performing at a way, way higher rate because the other folks are exploring, they're making mistakes, but they're learning. And they learn more breadth, but also more depth. And so once you shift things where now they have to extrapolate, okay, uh, things have changed in these ways, what might that mean? The folks who got the, the proceduralized skills only know what they were trained. They don't know any more than that. So they have a lot more difficulty grappling with the change. And on the individual differences side, it's kind of similar. Different, different constructs that have been examined in educational psych but are similar to promotion and prevention are something called goal orientation. So mastery or learning orientation, which is self-referential, I want to get better. So it's feedback reference to what I know, how do I, how do I increase my skill set, versus performance orientation, which is like being better than others. And so it's kind of comparative. I want to be better than others. And if I'm not, eh, kind of withdraw. Uh, and another one is called avoidance, which is kind of a prevention. And uh, we've been able to manipulate and ameliorate um, some of these individual differences in laboratory research, but not for avoidance. So if you're kind of anxiety prone, neurotic, uh, worried about making mistakes and how it's going to look, uh, maybe somebody else has a solution. But that's really, really difficult. And a lot of that starts in K-12 education and, and home learning. Otherwise, these, they're individual differences, but they're highly malleable during the developmental years. Thank you. And Linda, any comments? I have to confess I forgot the question. <laughs> <laughs> well, we can make it up. We're adapting. Yeah. <laughs> so um, one of the things that we've worried about. Thank you. Uh, in our work has shows a lot of benefits of keeping teams together. Uh, now, in the we, we've done work in the lab, but we've also done work in hospital settings and uh, manufacturing settings where we're finding that, and we worry: well, is there a risk that they'll get stale? Um, we're not getting at the point where we're finding that, and it may be that there's enough natural flow through of new people to keep them from getting terribly ossified. But that's. Uh, a worry we've had whether too much stability can be bad, but whether the groups, the real kind of groups we're studying, and there's enough natural ebb and flow that, you know, they're not getting ossified in that. But that that is a something we have in the back of our minds. Okay. Well, thank you. We want to have uh, a chance to. Oh. Oh. Okay. So Ken is up. Ken wants to ask a question. <laughs> And, feel, and also, if you have some, some questions, jot them down. We're opening it up now for, for general questions. Uh, just a question based on having to do the research to put this uh, event together. We started coming into this with the idea of looking for training for adaptability. And what we see instead is training that creates experiences where people are forced to be adaptable and therefore learn to be adaptable. Is is that a fair assessment? Or can you actually train for adaptability? It, well, I would say if you go back to that taxonomy, there's domain general, domain specific. So there are general capabilities that people have. I think Christian's research show, I mean, if you're being smarter is way uh, better than not being as smart mm -hmm. when things are changing and you have to learn stuff. Or having personality characteristics that make you more open to experience than closed off. That's going to be helpful. But if we're talking about specific setting, here's, here's the job, here are the people working on that job, now you're in a particular setting or context. So keeping people together is really important. I mean, just an anecdote on what Linda was talking about. NASA used to train shuttle astronauts together. They were a cohesive team. Uh, folks that go up on the ISS are trained separately. And they have problems integrating new people into the crew because of that. Uh, when we used to have bombers uh, up in the air all the time, SAC bomber crews, those people trained and served and lived together because it was mission critical. And so it's not like we don't know this uh, institutionally, it's just that it's expensive and difficult. 
Um, so, but to but go back to the point, yeah, I mean, we, uh, th there are techniques that give people skill sets, but they are somewhat contained to particular domains or tasks. And so it's about providing the kind of experiences that make people more flexible with some domain boundaries. So one of the things I wanted to talk about in my presentation, but I don't think I made the point, is simply what we've been talking about here yesterday and today, it's adaptability writ large. And there has to be some effort to begin to break it down into more containable or compact, smaller buckets, cups, that, are, that are, can be tackled a little bit easier. So can I pick up on that? Um, you're leaving me in a slightly uh, depressed state uh, with, mm -hmm. with what you're saying, because I would hope there's somewhere a body of research that says, this is what we could teach, or this is how we could train, or this is, this is what's wrong with people who are in front of these people where we're trying to get them to. So there's no real research going on that's, that, that explains how we can teach this or expand this or make it happen. I can't believe that. There has to be some scholarly work going on that looks at the educational system that says, you know, to all of your knowledge pools, if we did this, maybe Ernie comes closest to it, I don't know, um, we could accelerate. You know, we, maybe we still need to be domain specific. Maybe we need all the conditions that you're giving me, you know, all of the caveats. But there has to be something that we can do, no? Well, if, I mean, I'm, I'm, the, I'm not going to pretend to be an expert in the educational literature, but let's say I know a little, enough to be a little bit dangerous. It's this idea, Bob Bjork's idea of desirable difficulties. But you're in a classroom. So I'm training you math. It's, I'm giving you some difficulties, it's in math. So you've got to translate that across the variety of disciplines that we're exposing students to in K through 12 or once you get to university level. I mean, I don't know that there's this general adaptability trait. I mean, uh, again, there are way, I'm looking at a slide that doesn't exist anymore, but there are, you know, there are measures of it, and people will talk about it more broadly this afternoon, but it's like many things. The bigger the bucket, the less predictive it is of the specific things that you want to try to predict. So I want these workers to adjust to this particular change that's happening in their environment, and I'm using the big, uh, the big kind of broad construct. It's not going to be as effective as something that's much more tailored to the, specif the spec specifics. You know what I mean? Yeah. <laughs> of the particular change that we're yeah, trying to. Yeah. Can I can I jump in for a second? I'm gonna, you know, at, there are things that can be done that are broadly helpful, but they're not at the level of specificity that you really want to get to. And so, you know, really think about this as a two-handed approach. Things we can do broadly that are going to be general, so generalist. But once you're in a particular setting or environment where I want that airplane pilot to be able to recover from an emergency, this is about skills flying an airplane and not just handling emergencies. That's not going to cut it. Can I, can I jump in just for a second? Was that Sam who asked that question? Uh, no, it's Nick. It was Nick. Uh, it was oh, Nick. Nick. Okay. Uh, so, so Nick, here, here was my reaction. I think that you know, there's not going to be a magic bullet that is going to address uh, adaptability. And I think the main point I was trying to make is that this is one of a set of soft skills which need to be more emphasized in, I think, our educational system. Um, and again, with, uh, with, with love and respect, I'll say that's especially the case uh, with engineering training. And I have to, you know, contra you know, you know, uh, really say a, a word of a shout out to the National Academy of Engineering, which is, you know, through its initiatives like the uh, the Grand Challenges and Report 2020, uh, I think there is an effort, at least there's a recognition that we can teach these interactive skills, these soft skills, and that they are absolutely essential for success in a digital economy. And I believe that that can be taught uh, at the undergraduate level, for example. We have, uh, you know, with, with my program, we taught more than 300 undergraduates uh, to get better, we believe, and to be interested in issues of adaptability and empathy 
and cultural competence. We've actually taken that even further to high schools. And we have found that, uh, one, one anecdote, uh, we offered some training in these kinds of soft skills to undergraduates, and the semester came to an end. And, and these included uh, students from across the university. And they said, well, we want to learn more about these soft skills, including adaptability. And we said, well, the semester has come to an end. And they said, we don't care. We want to learn more about that stuff. And so we tacked on an extra five lectures, discussion groups, just to talk about adaptability and these soft skills. So uh, as several others have said, that there's not going to be a single solution. There are going to be solutions for high school kids, for university students, for people who are in domain-specific areas like uh, health services. Um, and I think we need to specify how to uh, nurture these soft skills at each of those very sites where the education or nurturing needs to take place. But I, I'm a little more optimistic. I think it, it can be done, but organizations like the academy or education, other educational institutions need to be much more um, intellectually and professionally aggressive to say that adaptability and like and other kinds of skills are a matter of uh, you know national performance. It's a big deal. It's not just something that we tack on to existing things. <laughs> okay, Nick. I've achieved my purpose then, Nick. <laughs> so I want to add uh the unlearning uh, side to this uh, as well. Uh, we can think about uh, forgetting as a, a sort of a negative thing uh, or, or a positive thing. It's, it's sort of our garbage collection uh, process. And uh, neuroscience has done some fascinating looks at how synapses actually actively disconnect a thing that was touching something else now lets go uh, based on experience that there no longer needs to be this uh, connection. And if we're talking about soft skills or, or teamwork and all these sorts of things, it, uh, to some extent, all the fabulous, cool experiences you got at the revised program at the this place and that place, if you're then going to spend the next 10 years in an environment that doesn't do anything with that, uh, it's going to unplug. It turns out you're will be faster on the relearn than on the first, but there's still a ton of loss, and you're now gonna need to have some retraining to shake the rust off of all those long forgotten collaboration and tennis skills or whatever <laughs> uh, you've had. So I think uh, uh, continuing those, those training experiences and putting people in, you know, uh, communication and uh, and change situations. If you want to keep those alive, they need to be supported. Yeah, no, if, could I amplify? Because I wasn't trying to say it's an impossible problem. I'm just saying that it's going to take different kinds of solutions. There isn't the big magic bullet. So how you, how we train kids in K through 12? A lot of it is proceduralized. Maybe we should be changing some of that where it's more exploratory. Uh, how do we train? People in college are trying not to teach undergraduates anymore, but when we do, what do we do? We throw a bunch of things on PowerPoint slides and they regurgitate it back. There's not a lot of exploration going on with that. And then when you get to the workplace, making a mistake and learning from it, there are a lot of cultures or environments, leadership, that doesn't want to tolerate that. So, I mean, I'm simply saying that you have to tailor solutions across the different environments people are going to be in. I don't think it's impossible, but it takes a kind of a broad scale mindset change, if you will. Uh -huh. <laughs> and I'll cont hopefully continue that quickly. Um, if one looks across different areas, not just adaptability, but some of the creativity literature, et cetera, I think a message that comes out is the importance of, of learning by doing in that people, if you give them, whether it's projects in school or, or projects at work, people learn more from that and are more likely to be creative than sort of didactic, you know, lectures. So I think there's robust knowledge of that coming from different contexts that we want to move and push on that front. And, and 
in the cooperative part, yeah. right? So, I mean, to the soft skill side, but actually doing projects with other people where you have to interact. I don't mean slicing it up and you write this and you do that and put it together. And, and that's hard because the educational system doesn't really do that. So I think, was, you have a question? Sorry. Michael, oh, you have the, yes. Um, it's funny because you actually answered my question. Um, because my question would have been, is there any way to eradicate the lecture? <laughs> because that's actually, I think, the problem with not having experiential project-based learning. Um, we did an out-of-school training program. And there is no lecture whatsoever. And what I would share about it as we went to make it a credit-based program, we were mortified to learn that because we don't do lecture, it's all learned by doing, that it, the credit system frowns upon that and essentially says, sorry, that's not valuable. Uh, and, oh, yes. <laughs> so, so we're disturbed that you've got a higher ed system that actually rewards lecture format does not reward learning by doing project-based learning. And you know, to me, that's part of what I would call an infrastructure system that needs to be, uh, and that's a Carnegie-based unit system that just needs to be looked at in terms of how could we start suggesting that new learning models, in fact, are more important to embed into higher ed learning culture. So, and I think Annette ha had a question, and then there's over here. And so um, part two of that question, um, and you know, I think I'm on the committee because of my background on the technical skilled workforce side of it, which is much more hands-on, um, and um, I think a lot of the concern is about as, um, as as we move to artificial intelligence, um, where is that workforce going to fit in? And, and we um, tend to be more hands-on. And so um, do, do you have any thoughts about um, how that um, workforce will adapt to um, the changes? make a quick comment that I think still having the hands-on is valuable. I'm struck. I remember back in the 80s when the, the first, uh, first in my experience, push to AI, what they were finding was that a lot of uh, the people that got benefits from it were the people that were there when it was developed and fully understood it. Um, and I'm told by my colleagues that are more active currently that they're still finding out elements of that. So how we balance that, there are going to be interesting issues here, but I, I think there's still a room for hands-on. Maybe not as many people hands-on, but still a room and a need for that. So I'd like to say something a little uh, different and complementary to her question. It's nonsense to think that just because we're moving to a world of AI or machine learning, <coughs> that the only people who can do this are the highly educated uh, bachelors, masters, PhDs. And what she's poking at is the whole middle skill uh, issue. And to think that middle skilled people can't do AI or machine learning is just a bogus idea. Mm -hmm. Yet nobody's saying that. And nobody is taking that responsibility on to say, OK, we don't have a rivet gun anymore. <laughs> You know, okay, there is no right wheel that needs to be put, you know, uh, on the front of the car. You do this, you do that. I mean, th this is the workflow issue I tried to raise earlier that no one is paying attention to. And we're just, we're, we're, we're feeding ourselves, you know, our, our own, uh, you know, stuff. Uh, we're, we're, we're breathing and drinking our own bath water in our own air. It's nonsense. And somewhere along the line, somebody's got to step out and be bold on this topic. Remember, we're supposed to be talking about a surprise here. You know, something that didn't really, you know, isn't obvious. You know, overlapping things that don't make sense. So before you leave here today, where is the surprise? And then one more question. So, uh, 
I, I guess the, the, for me, the, the big sort of how can both of these things be true that's related to that. So we have uh, uh, a large number of people unemployed uh, in a particular sector that don't have you know, advanced degrees. Uh, and yet at the same time, the, the biggest gaps in the STEM workforce where we've got current large numbers of unfilled positions and projections of it only getting worse, uh, they're not at the bachelor's, master's, and PhDs level. They're at the associate's degree. It's not that much training that's required to fill these massive gaps. And you know, university presidents, they hate to fess up to that because they just want there to be more funding for PhDs and masters and, and bachelors. So most of the reports do their best to hide this fact. Uh, but really, you know, it just seems like it's not that big a leap given who's looking for positions and what level of training is required to fill those uh, you know, where we have the gaps. I'd like to respond with an anecdote. So uh, many years ago when I first moved to Michigan, we were able to go in an automobile plant that was introducing robotic assembly lines. And we built a little questionnaire and surveyed a bunch of people about that um, change that was being evaluated. If you were skilled tradespeople, you were happy because you were going to get more training and be more valuable and it would be fantastic. And if you were an assembly line worker, you weren't so happy because you were going to be let go. You, maybe you could move to some other job doing the same thing in the company, but you weren't going to get the training. So a lot has to do with what's in it for you. And I think the, the part of the question that you're asking, there are a lot of people who are going to be displaced by various technical, technological changes. Nobody's ever told them and they don't think themselves that they're capable of dealing with it. And so that, again, part of it is education, part of it's going to be upbringing, but there are no support systems that try to change those minds. I think we have one more question. Yes. Hi, I'm David Rosowski. I'm the Provost and Executive Vice President at the University of Vermont. Um, I, I want to just offer a university perspective for a minute and then close with a comment about who's, who's driving the bus in our, in our field right now. Um, I think that when we think about adaptation and resilience, um, we may not have used those words, but I think universities have actually been playing in this space longer than we may be giving them credit for. I think we, we're thinking about what it takes for students to not only um, graduate on time, but be successful out in the real world. And we're starting, I think, in my, my engineering discipline, we're starting to think much more about how that world is likely to change phenomenologically as well as uh, ontologically. So I think we're thinking about that. We're, we're you know, to, to Nick's point, we're, we're deep into the T-shaped model, whether we call it that or not. You know this. Um, we have integrated studies. We have transdisciplinary projects. We have life cycle considerations. We, we allow the real world problems and the NAE grant challenges to help define our projects. We offer certificates that are stackable or standalone. Um, I also think that the universities have changed. Even my university, which is a very staid institution by many measures, has really evolved dramatically in the last 20 years, the way we think about experiential education, the way that we think of connecting to the real world and having impact from, from the moment a student steps on our campus, the learning by doing things, the flipped classrooms thing, even the way we design facilities now is completely different. And, it, and it's, the facilities are adaptable. The facilities are intellectually resilient. So I, I think we're maybe at least on the right path and the flipped classroom, which really came out of, I believe it came out of the study of physics and was quickly picked up by most of the engineering disciplines, our entire college of medicine has gone to the flipped classroom. It's the first institution in the nation to do it. Uh, our, the case, case um, style of learning that business schools have moved to, I think we're really different than the old classrooms that keep getting, you know, universities keep getting tagged with and then the last point I want to make was um, from Robert Johnson's really Im important and stimulating presentation this morning, where we talk about the younger people have, uh, you know, uh, they're, they're advancing more quickly into leadership and into being the real innovators and the real, real drivers. I see that even in higher education, where students are driving us now. Okay, and that's that's a that's a sea change. So. Um, it used to be when I was a dean of engineering and before that that you know I had this big corporate board that spoke to us and they drove us and they told us what the needs were and who we had to train, who we had to prepare. And 
the students are coming to us now and they're saying we want it on our phone, we want to be in integrated teams, we don't want to be in the classroom all day, we want to go get an internship, we want to study abroad, we want to work in a laboratory, whatever the case is. So don't forget, <laughs> as important as all these people are here and all the people we work with, the students really are driving us. And if, if we encounter in education faculty resistance to change, which we do, we can talk about that another time, I found that when we're pushed by the students rather than exclusively by industry, the faculty move more quickly and respond more quickly and therefore are more adaptable. Well, that's a wonderful, hopeful note to end on. Thank you, David, and thank you to the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.